Hi, I'm John Harrington, and welcome to the AIDL Application and Funding Process Part 2 video. I'm a professional photographer, author, and filmmaker, and I applied for the EIDL loan from the Small Business Administration. Here's a quick recap of the Part 1 video, which you, really, you should really go back and watch. On the 30th of March, I applied. On the 20th of April, I got the advance deposited into my bank account. On the 2nd of May, I was notified of my next steps. And on the 12th of May, I actually did the application and completed it. After I completed the EIDL application on the SBA website, I waited. Here's what happened next. On the 14th of May, I got an email from the Small Business Administration with an issue regarding my credit report. They asked me to go back to the portal and make sure that something on my street address was changed. I immediately sent a response via email back to the person who'd contacted me asking which address he was asking me to verify or correct. Was it my personal address or my corporate address? I wasn't sure which one they were using since the application was for my corporation and not for me personally. Within just a few minutes, I got an email back from the contractor at the SBA telling me that they were using my personal address, notified me what my credit rating was, and then pointed out that the issue, in fact, was that there was a comma in the line for the street address. So again, here's the street address that I entered. You'll note the comma after the word street. In Washington, D.C., it's common to use the indicator southeast, southwest, northeast, northwest, right after the address because of the quadrants of the city. You'll see here, this is the corrected address with the comma removed there was no problem. I then got this email back from the contractor affirming that I was all set, that he had in fact corrected the address and that my application was going forward. I wrote him back because now I had a contact at the Small Business Administration. I really wanted some extra information. I wanted to know if the value of the loan that I had asked for was being adjusted in any way. So I sent him this email. Within a few moments, this is the email I got back. So that was on May 14th. On May 15th, I got an alert on my LifeLock Identity Theft Protection account that had notified me that my credit had been checked. This is the alert that I got asking me whether or not it was me that was actually make, uh, uh, authorized this credit, uh, credit check. I, of course, hit yes, and this popped up on the screen showing, you know, affirming for LifeLock that this was not, in fact, an attempt to uh, steal my identity. So the next day on May 16th, I got an email from the Small Business Administration affirming that, in fact, my SBA loan had been approved now that they've run my credit and gotten a satisfactory response. One of the things I'd like to point out here and pause for just a minute is to really point out the importance of clicking on links and emails. You'll see here there's a, it says view account and there's a link there. When you mouse over that email, you'll see that it comes up with an actual legitimate SBA government website URL. It's not some kind of a spam link. I suspect that at some point we are going to start seeing emails that look just like this and it's going to actually be spam. So it's always safest to uh, hit to mouse over the link, check the link. And in this case, not only did I do that, I copied and pasted the link. This is the actual URL here uh, that I used there to cut and paste into my browser. So I was was ensured that I wasn't going I wasn't I wasn't dealing with any spam or, or any any phishing schemes. So again, here's that email. So here I am on the SBA website. You'll see now that I can click the start button to sign the closing documents. When I do that, the opportunity comes up here for me to click sign. And here is what comes up on the SBA website with DocuSign. By clicking here, I was agreeing to the use of electronic records and signatures. This made sure that I was able to actually do this online and didn't have to deal with any paper forms or wet signatures. I click continue and then click start. The PDF I was working through was 19 pages in length. The first seven pages of that was the loan document. There was another three pages that was the promissory note. So that promissory note was three pages. I'm gonna walk you through the seven page loan document and the three page promissory note with some of the highlights. I'm not gonna go over every clause, a lot of it's boilerplate. And a lot of the things that are in here, you'll see are relative to uh, disasters that occur in a small area or a state or just a couple of states. In this case, the disaster area really is the entire United States. Uh, so there's a clause in there, for example, which I'll go over, which talks about not moving out of the disaster area, for example. Uh, generally speaking, unless you're moving out of the United States, that wouldn't apply to you. Uh, but I want to go over this again. I'm not a lawyer. 
this is not legal advice, but I do have, a, I am an expert in the business practices of photography and business practices in general. So uh, hopefully you'll take that into consideration when we're going through this together. Uh, use these things relative to things that are specific to you. Uh, obviously your needs may be different than mine. So let's go through those with some of the highlights and interesting points in the documentation. Oh, one point before we proceed, I'm not going to put the highlights up on the screen for each of the documents long enough for you to read them in their entirety. So go ahead and hit the pause button as we're going through it and read it as much as you want before we then go on to the next clause. So with that in mind, let's have a look. Uh, it's pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, installment payments talks about that having to begin 12 months from the date of the promissory note. Talks about the interest. Okay, here. It talks about loans that are in excess of $25,000. The Small Business Administration takes a security interest in collateral, and then they go to define what collateral is later on in the document. In this clause, it talks about using the proceeds of the loan solely for working capital to alleviate economic injury. I think this is in large part so that you don't see people using these funds for extravagant purposes or, or really not associated with the ongoing operation of your business. Here's an interesting part of the loan document. It talked about having itemized receipts whenever requested by the SBA so that you're showing that you're using these for business purposes. You would have to have these receipts anyway when it came to the operation of your business and when you're filing your taxes and so on and so forth. The SBA wants to make sure you have those receipts and that you know that they could request copies of these receipts. Another interesting thing here is that you will not sell or transfer any of the collateral that you use to secure this loan. I, I think they're probably thinking more about along the lines of uh, cars, buildings, or other uh, infrastructure. Obviously, you need to sell things to operate your business, um, but they're talking about things that are collateral that they so that you're not selling these items uh, if they ever should need to come and claim that collateral as a result of a default on the loan. Here, the SBA talks about how you have to retain your receipts for three years from the date of the final disbursement. The interesting thing here is that that means that essentially if it's a 30-year loan and it's three years after, you need to actually keep those receipts for 33 years. That's far and away greater than what the IRS requires for receipt records uh, when you're filing your taxes. Uh, I think that this also refers to if you're paying your loan back early, then you, you'd wanna definitely have receipts for those three years following when you paid the loan back, should they ever have a question or reason to audit you. Here's that point I made earlier about relocating without the prior written permission of the Small Business Administration. Uh, you can't move with uh, the proceeds of this loan. Again, I think this is more having to do with moving out of a disaster area. Uh, in this case, the entire disaster area is the United States. So uh, unless you're leaving the country, you shouldn't have a problem. I thought this was also very interesting. Required you uh, wherever feasible to use American-made equipment. That's a reasonable request. It was also interesting here to find out that you could actually request a loan increase, uh, but you've got two years from the date of the loan approval to do that. For the deadline for the return of the loan documents, you have to actually execute this document within two months of the loan authorization. Here's another interesting clause because these funds are obviously supposed to be used uh, to get your business up and running again, but if you get other proceeds from say an insurance policy or other re reimbursements or grants from a state, in theory here, according to these clauses, you need to actually turn those funds over to the SBA as part of the repayment of your loan. In other words, the SBA wants to be considered the primary provider of these benefits and that if you're getting money from other sources, they're gonna want that money uh, to pay them back. Again, if it wasn't clear already, the SBA is requiring you to use the loan proceeds solely for the purposes of working capital to alleviate this economic injury caused by the disaster. Here was another clause that I wasn't expecting, but I thought was reasonable, and that was the requirement that you maintain insurance for the assets that you have used to secure the loan uh, from, and you have to provide proof of that insurance uh, to the SBA. I, I think in this case, what they're referring to more than anything are buildings or infrastructure, uh, other things that could be in a place where this disaster, because this is probably boilerplate text, uh, the dis another disaster could come, say you're in Florida and there's a hurricane and then there's another hurricane. You need to make sure you have insurance to protect those assets that they use to give you that loan in the first place. Uh, obviously, it still applies here, but in this case, uh, the likelihood that, uh, that you're going to have a problem with that that's going to cause uh, those assets to be diminished or depleted is less. 
Here under Books and Records, it talks about having to keep the most recent five years of receipts until three years after the date of maturity, including extensions. Here, the SBA can actually require you to pay for an audit if they're asked for it. Here was a clause I wasn't expecting where the borrower will furnish financial statements within three months of the close of the fiscal year. In addition, if the SBA has any questions about your business operations, you have to actually pay for and have an accountant's review report prepared. This clause limits distribution of assets. So here it's basically saying that you're not going to, without the prior written consent of the SBA, make any distribution of your assets to any owner or partner. Uh, so this is second and away from the point about not selling them. Uh, you can't actually give them or distribute them to an owner or partner of the company. Now under borrower certifications, you're certifying that there hasn't been any change to your financial position. Here you're certifying that you haven't paid for anybody to prepare these for you. This kind of avoids people going in and making lots of money off of borrowers that are in a, uh, a very difficult position. So here they're, you're certifying that you didn't pay someone to prepare these documents for you outside of and above what you've already disclosed that you might have paid. Here again, the SBA is requiring you that you affirm that you haven't gotten any money from any other sources unless you have disclosed it to the SBA. Again, the SBA drives home the point about no fees having been paid for services provided or to be provided in connection with applying for or closing this loan, other than reported on the loan application. Next is what happens if you violate the loan authorization and agreement. The loan will be in default and the SBA can de declare any or all parts of the indebtedness immediately due and payable. And so those are some of the highlights of the loan application and agreement. Next, we're going to go into the promissory note. That was just a three page document that was also included in the PDF. So let's go through some of the highlights of that. So here the SBA defines what collateral means, talks about the property and the business. Here is a fairly extensive paragraph that talks about you selling or otherwise transferring or account to the SBA satisfaction for any of the collateral or its proceeds. Under the promissory note, the SBA could require immediate payment of all amounts owed under the note if you're in default. And lastly, the misuse of loan funds. Anyone who wrongfully misapplies any proceeds of the loan will be civilly liable to the SBA for one and a half times the proceeds disbursed in addition to other remedies allowed by law. After reading the whole document, I clicked here on sign to electronically sign the document. Because DocuSign didn't have my signature, they gave me the opportunity to review a kind of a cursive version of my signature and my initials. Once I accepted them, I clicked adopt and sign. Once I adopted that signature, I came to this screen where I would click on sign. And once I'd done that, click on next. Further on in the PDF, I needed to sign again. So I clicked on sign and then clicked next. And with those two signatures in place, the SBA website tells me that I've completed the signing of the loan documents. You'll see here, it now says signed, and now I have the opportunity to click continue. You see now under steps to complete, all three of the steps have been completed. So on Saturday night, May 16th, late in the evening, I completed all of the closing documents necessary in order for that loan, the EIDL loan to be funded. And on May 19th, the funds were deposited into my account 50 days later from the beginning of the application process. So that's where we are. Uh, we were able to finish the process in 50 days from application to funds in the bank account and available for use by the business. Thanks for taking the time to watch the video. I hope you found it helpful.